Good morning, Trinity. We hope you had an amazing Christmas and got all the gifts that you really wanted. My name is Peyton. And my name is Kaysen. And we'll be your hosts today. We're going to give you a few ways that you can connect with us online. On your screen is a QR code. Scan this code to complete the checkout form. You can also find this code in the chat below. We are excited to announce our brand new sermon series next Sunday, January 2nd, called Known. God is the ultimate creator and designer, and while each of us have different fears, we are all uniquely individually made. And the Enneagram is a powerful tool used for understanding ourselves and the people around us. Relationships are complex but necessary. Through this study, we're going to learn how to empathize better with others. We're going to be looking at different biblical characters through the lenses of an Enneagram to learn how to better ourselves and work with other people better. We can't wait to see you there to dive into this awesome study. Our Trinity Kids is beginning their weekly studies on January 11th, and we are excited to announce they will be adding an extra day on Thursdays. For more information, you can contact Ms. Paula Roan or contact the church office at the number below. We know this week is a little weird with us meeting online and all, but next week we will be meeting back in the Fellowship Hall at 945. Now that you know a few ways to stay connected, let's head over to our Kids Corner to see a video from Ms. Paula Roan. Merry Christmas. It is good to be here with you this morning, boys and girls, and all those who are watching online. It's the day after Christmas. I'm sure that your day yesterday was just filled with wonder and excitement and family and fun and friends. I love Christmas. I love the Christmas lights. I love the Christmas music. I play it in my car as soon as it comes on the end of November. I love the parties and I love the Christmas food. And all of that sometimes gets lost, the true, real meaning of Christmas. It's Jesus' birthday. That's what it's all about. We celebrate Jesus' birthday on Christmas. Yes, it's the day after Christmas, but we're still in the Christmas season. So if you haven't already made a cake and had a birthday party for Jesus, I encourage you to go grab a cupcake or make a cake with your family. Celebrate this time. Jesus has come to show us how to love others. Have a great day. Happy birthday, Jesus. Thank you, Miss Paula, for that awesome message about the true meaning of Christmas. Now let's get our hearts ready for worship as we sing a joy to the world from our praise band.
What a great song to get our hearts ready for today's message from Pastor Scott. I agree. And before we enter a time of prayer, I would like to remind everyone that this is the last day of our sermon series, Welcome. We've been discussing how we can get ready for the arrival of Jesus into our lives by comparing it to how we welcome guests into our home. This week, as we wrap up the series by learning about how we can grow, change, and improve our lives, we would like to welcome you in a time of prayer to prepare for the message. Dear God, we thank you for bringing us all here today, and we pray that you can open our hearts to receive this message, and we pray that you can also help to prepare us for the new year. Amen. Christmas isn't just a time to decorate your house, to spend time with loved ones, and to open long-awaited presents. Christmas is a time to remember, to remember that salvation doesn't come from within, it comes from above. To remember that infinitely better than the magic of Christmas is the miracle of Emmanuel. To remember that God was not and is not untouched by the pain and suffering of this world. To remember that Jesus isn't just part of the Christmas story, but Christmas is part of the Jesus story. To remember that there is no grace without a cross and no cross without a manger. To remember that Jesus doesn't just want us to remember what he did, but to join him in what he is doing. So this year, let the lights remind you of the light of the world who came into darkness for us. Let the gifts remind you of the greatest gift of all. And this year, make your heart like Bethlehem and receive the King. Hi, have you ever experienced post-Christmas blues? Our sermon series has been called Welcome. We've been comparing the season of Advent and then Christmas to the season of waiting for Christ to come and then Christ's coming at Christmas. We've been comparing it to waiting for a dinner guest to come to our house for the celebration. We so far preached on anticipation, anticipating the arrival of the guest. We've talked about cleaning up our house, tidying up so our house is ready for the guest. We've talked about preparing the table, preparing the food for the guest. And then we talked about celebrating the time with the guests. That's a time of celebration. And then after the dinner, well, you know, the guests who were there, they, they go home. And then there's dirty plates all, all over the, the table. And the kitchen, there are a bunch of dirty pots piled up. And the kitchen counter is a mess. And then, you know, we, we got to clean up. And then we got to go back to ordinary life. Uh, today is the day after Christmas. And then a few days is going to come the new year. And after the new year, well, we go back to work. We go back to school. We go back to the ordinary routines of life. And some of us may even experience kind of a post-Christmas letdown. And if you're someone who d experiences that, well, then this sermon is for you. Because I want to tell you that God blesses ordinary life. The ordinary life that God gives us is a gift that God blesses. And it's through ordinary life, during ordinary time, that God grows us to our full and glorious potential. And, and we're going to understand this because we're going to look at Jesus's life. And Jesus, as he was being raised, lived an ordinary life. Jesus, after he was born in Bethlehem, well, he, the scripture tells us that he grew in, in wisdom and stature. He ended up moving back to Nazareth, the town of his parents, and he lived an ordinary life. And, and then we come across this wonderful story in the Gospel of Luke about what happened when Jesus was a boy. Remember, Nazareth is about 40 miles north of Jerusalem. And whenever they had one of the Jewish religious festivals, well, Jesus' parents and Jesus, they would travel down to Jerusalem to participate in these worship events. And during one of them, the following took place. This is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, beginning with verse 41. Now, every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among the relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. 
After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astounded, astonished. And his mother said to him, child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart and Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. Let us pray. Guide my speaking, Lord. Call to my remembrance what you want me to say and, and let it truly be a reflection of the good news of what you've done for us in Jesus and guide all our listening wherever we are so that we will grow as your disciples. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Here's my message. God shows us the goodness of ordinary life in Jesus Christ. Because he, here in this story, there, there is no miracle. There's no angels lighting up the night sky with a wonderful proclamation. It's a story of a intelligent boy who is learning about who his heavenly father is. He's learning about what the scriptures are meaning. He's growing in his understanding of what his mission is. There's no miracle here. In fact, even when Joseph and Mary were looking for Jesus, there was no miracle in their finding him because it took them three days. And they finally went to the temple and, and Jesus was surprised that they took that long to find him because he was where he was supposed to be. There's no miracle in today's story, but that's okay because it's a story that we can all relate to. It's a story about ordinary life. And this is a story that in a way that God consecrates ordinary life. Jesus, after he was born and, and, and he was a good Jewish person who kept going down to Jerusalem for the different festivals, he ended up in Nazareth and he grew to be a stonemason. That's literally, I mean, we say carpenter, but it, the actual word is, it means stonemason. Jesus, in other words, would have been a construction worker. That's nothing or extraordinary. That's an ordinary job that others would have had. But at the same time, this was not an ordinary person. This was an extraordinary person because he was the Son of God. He was the Messiah. He was God with us, Emmanuel. But then again, it was ordinary because when God took on our flesh in the incarnation, which is the incarnation means that God took on our flesh and entered our human existence, our human history, our course of human life by becoming one of us. Well, he chose to do so in, in a way, that, in a person that was quite ordinary. Jesus lived an ordinary life until he began his ministry at age 30. This tells us that God loves ordinary life and that ordinary life is a blessing. Why am I preaching on this? Why do we need to hear this? Because it tells us that our ordinary lives are not something to escape from, not something to try to run from, not something to evade. It tells us that life, human life is not a bad thing, that this is a good thing. It affirms the goodness of life. Luke tells us that Jesus grew and, and became strong and was filled with wisdom and divine favor. It, it kind of reminds me of a verse in, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. When it talks about Jesus, the writer says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus understands what it's like to live our lives. He understands what it's like to grow up. He understands the joy of friendship. He also understands the grief of having lost someone whom he loves. God, when God took on our human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, well, God took on you know, all our strengths, and God also took on our limits, our weaknesses. Now, Jesus was fully divine, but he was also fully God at the same time. And with that came all the limits of what it means to be human. But then came also the, the joys of being human, too. My sermon is called, Called to Change. 
And I'm thinking, oh, maybe I should have called it call to grow. I mean, we change as people, but we're meant to grow as people. We're meant to grow, we grow physically, but we're also meant to grow emotionally. We're meant to grow spiritually. We're meant to grow in responsibility. And, and there's joy in growing. There's joy in learning. There's joy when you're in high school and you go on a field trip at night and you look through a telescope and you see Saturn for the first time. What joy there is in seeing Saturn for the first time through a telescope. Or there's joy when you're in middle school, middle school science class, and you look through a microscope and you see an, an amoeba for the first time. I mean, do you remember the joy you had when you were a little child and you went to school for the first time? My mom, she used to tell me the story when me, in, in my first day of first grade, I, I was, you know, I wanted to read. I was kind of frustrated because I couldn't read. My brother could read and I could not read. And my mom said, well, be patient. When you go to school, you will learn how to read. And so I went to school on my first day full of joy and excitement. And then when I came home, my mom asked, you know, Scott, how did you like your first day? And she said, I was frustrated. I said, I didn't learn anything. I didn't learn how to read. <laughs> but I, I later did learn how to read. There's joy in learning. Many of you know Jane Johnson. That's the little 18-month-old girl of John and Melissa Johnson. And when we had the movie at our church, we watched before Christmas the movie Elf, a group of us gathered. And while we were watching in the fellowship hall, 18-month-old Jane, she was walking all over the fellowship hall. She walked up to where our worship stage was and got up on our stage. And I think about Jane, there's such joy in her face as she's walking, such joy as she's exploring because she's learning. And that's the joy of growing. I think of it this way. You know, on Christmas days, on these big days of celebration, uh, we like to eat good, fatty, rich foods. You know, a good pecan pie, a good prime rib. But the thing is, my doctor say, if I eat that kind of food every day, well, that's not good for me. It's going to kill me. So most of the time, I eat things like a, a grilled chicken salad or a bowl of oatmeal for breakfast. I know it doesn't sound like fun, but it's really good because it makes me healthy and it helps me to grow. And it's during these ordinary times, that's when we grow. That's when God grows us into our full glorious potential. And, and it's even better because God makes ordinary life holy in Jesus Christ. Something that's holy is something that's pure, something that's worth venerating. And when Jesus took on our flesh, when God took our flesh in Jesus, that God made human life holy. It made it good. Remember when God created the world and human beings, it says in the book of Genesis that God said it was very good. Ordinary life, well, that is very good. There's this experience that people have called FOMO. It's the fear of missing out, FOMO, fear of missing out. I mean, what happens is that people will look on social media like Instagram or TikTok and they'll see what others supposedly, the exciting grand things that they're doing, the extraordinary things that others are supposedly doing. And then they look at their own life and they think, well, I'm inconsequential. My life is no good. I have no value. But you know, your life is tremendously important to God. Your life has value. You're not missing out on anything. See, we have these great big celebrations at time, like a great Christmas dinner a great fireworks show, uh, going to Disney World and, and seeing the Christmas parade. Those are great events, wonderful events, and they're good. But life doesn't always have these highs. Life can't always have these highs. And so having a family dinner around a kitchen table of meatloaf and broccoli, well, that's good too. Or reading a a familiar children's story at bed to your child at night, well, that, that's good too. Or reading a good mystery before you go to bed, well, that's good. See, the ordinary things that God gives us, well, we celebrate that. And, and the story from the Jesus, no miracle, he was just lived an ordinary life of a child seeking and learning and growing. Saint Benedict, he was a medieval a theologian, Christian leader. He started the monastic movement in Europe in, in the medieval times, early medieval times. And one of the things Benedict taught his monks in his monasteries was that uh, they should learn to thrive where they're planted. Instead of always seeking to move to a different monastery, to a different place, always seeking to grow, uh, not to grow, but to find the next best thing, thinking the next monastery was better, uh, Benedict, he taught that, no, no, it's the ordinary place where you are now. Stay planted there, 
learn to thrive there because it's in these ordinary places that God grows us. Ordinary life, the times after Christmas, the times of routine, the times of work, well, we grow into our full glorious potential and we embrace ordinary life. We don't try to flee it, we embrace it. And God gives us two tools, two ways to help us grow in ordinary life. One is family. I think God in God's infinite wisdom, well, he did the right thing by placing Jesus in the family of Mary and his adopted father, Joseph, because God saw that these were the, were the right parents for his son, that they would raise Jesus right, and, and they did. Uh, we have family. God gives us family to help us grow. And you may be thinking, well, you know, Scott, well, that's some people, but I, you know, I don't have a spouse. I don't have children. Scott, you know, my, my parents are dead. Or Scott, you know, my parents, they, they really were not a source of strength for me. And I hear you. I get that. But the thing you have to realize is that family is not just about biological biological connections. F family is also about spiritual connections, the people we choose to associate with. And so God and God's wisdom tells us that we are to call our fellow believers in Christ, fellow people in the church, we're to call them brothers and sisters in Christ because God gives us a family in Christ. So if you don't have a family, if you don't have someone to rely on, then come to Trinity, come and connect with us and, and we'll gladly be your brothers and we'll gladly be your sisters in Christ so that you can have a family to help you grow into your full glorious potential. So God gives us family to help us grow in ordinary time. And God also gives us faith. Again, Jesus was, he was a good Jewish boy who followed the Jewish faith. His family went to the Jerusalem three times a year because of the Jewish religious festivals. He celebrated that. In fact, when Jesus got older and he began his public ministry, Luke tells us that every Sabbath day he went to the synagogue as was his custom. Luke uses those words, as was his custom, because Jesus understood that the rhythms of ordinary life, attending worship, doing those things, that, that shaped us, that molded us, that helped us grow. So God gives us things such as worshiping on Sunday. God gives us the practice of reading scripture, joining together in a group with other Christians to support one another. God gives us prayer. God gives us many ordinary means, which in the end really become extraordinary because God works through them to grow us. So here's my question for you today. What, what practice, what ordinary practice is God calling you to take up or renew in this new year in 2022? Is God calling you to to begin reading the Bible again, to, come, to have a daily reading program or, or read a good devotional book? Is God calling you to start listening to praise music when you're driving to work? And that, that can be a time of prayer as you drive listening to praise music. Is God calling you to really get back in the habit of coming to church on Sunday and worshiping? There are many things that, that God gives us in faith to help us grow. And then maybe God's calling you to renew a relationship with someone, to reach out to someone who you've been neglecting or someone who needs your help. Uh, what is the one thing that God is calling you to do in 2022 in order to grow? It doesn't have to be extraordinary. It's better if it's not extraordinary. Just what ordinary thing is God calling you to do? Because here's the thing, in Jesus Christ, God blesses ordinary life because Jesus embraced ordinary life. Until he became 30 years old, he, he was a, growing up in Nazareth and then became a stonemason. He understands ordinary life. We celebrate that and we embrace the ordinary life God, that God gives us because it's during ordinary times, such as the times after Christmas, such as the times we go back to work and school, those are the times we grow into our full God-given potential. Or really, better yet, those are the times that God grows us, the Holy Spirit grows us to our full God-given potential. Merry Christmas. We still have 12 days of Christmas and Happy New Year. Thanks for joining us today, and we hope you were inspired by today's message. We hope that you check out the worship guide online so you can dive deeper into today's message with friends and family. Thank you again for joining and we hope to see you next week at the in-person service at 945. We hope you had a great week.